I came to the conclusion I'd done everything I could do except get killed. Robert Strange is the only survivor and witness to one of Australia's most brutal and cold-blooded murders. Yeah, it's a struggle, living with the nightmares. It's a daily struggle, in all honesty, and they're not nightmares because it, it actually did happen. Robert and his colleague, Glenn Turner, two government employees doing their jobs, were held hostage on this lonely country road. For 20 terrifying minutes, 79-year-old farmer Ian Turnbull subjected them to a bizarre game of cat and mouse. He despised Glenn Turner and all that he stood for. Sounds a wicked evil man, the sort of farming family. And was determined to kill him. It was an execution, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. He went there with the sole intention, in my opinion, of killing Glenn Turner. And be that if he did it in one shot or be it if he did it in seven or eight. He didn't leave that location until he believed that he had killed him. What happened next would leave a community shattered. There's been a division of feeling in, in the community because really other people aren't sure of what's happened exactly and why it's happened. And a family grief-stricken. Two children without a dad and a wife wanting justice. It was a planned and cowardly attack somebody who was defenceless. When Alison met Glenn, they were both in their late 30s. He was very opinionated <laughs> and didn't always agree with him. <laughs> but um, he was a very passionate man. He had a soft heart, he really did, yeah. They'd gone to a singles dinner looking for love. She caught his eye right away. We chatted and we found that we had very similar backgrounds and both growing up in a very small country town, very fairly poor family. And he just didn't want me to leave his side <laughs> that night. <laughs> and yeah, so we, the rest is history. Less than a year later, Alison and Glenn moved in together, buying this rural property in Tamworth. Oh, he just loved this place. It was his uh, and, and mine. It was our, our oasis, really. Their oasis was a perfect place to start a family. First a daughter, Alexandra, and then a son, Jack. Close to their home, he planted a forest. Glenn decided that we needed to stabilise the creek bank, so we undertook this major tree planting operation, <laughs> planted a thousand little tube stocks in here of native trees. So all of these, all these you, you, all these, you planted? Yeah, yeah. Wow, it's a big job. <laughs> Glenn was passionate about his job as a compliance officer for the Department of Environment and Heritage. His job was to make sure farmers stuck to the rules that limited how much vegetation they could clear. The laws are designed to give wildlife ample cover and protect the land from erosion. He loved going out and talking to farmers. He hated being in the office and his favourite part of the job was to just go out and chat to old mates <laughs> and um, more often than not, be yeah, invited in for a cup of tea and cake or something, and he just loved that. Glenn's territory included this area, known as the Golden Triangle of northern New South Wales. It has some of the most fertile land in Australia, and clearing that land can make a farmer a fortune. So there was growing tension. There was, there was there was always tension, especially in, in relation to, to broad-scale land clearing. Where tension was felt was in the in the broad-scale clearing areas such as uh, Moree and, and Walgett. And few had more to gain from broad-scale land clearing than Ian Turnbull. By bulldozing native forests, crops could be grown, substantially increasing the value of the land. If a farmer, for example, had 200 hectares 
of grazing land um, that was not developed that may well be worth $2 million. If that farmer clears that 200 hectares and turns it into a cropping land, that land may well then be worth five times that amount of money because you can turn over a crop annually on, on, that, on that area. So you were the guy standing between a farmer on a property worth, say, two million, and a farmer on a property worth 10 million? Potentially, yeah. Glenn's job put him on a collision course with one of the biggest farming families in the Golden Triangle. Out here, the Turnbulls are a big deal. How big? Thousands of hectares worth millions of dollars. And I'm standing right in the middle of it. The family patriarch was 79-year-old Ian Turnbull. What did you know about the Turnbulls? I knew that they were, uh, they were currently in court or with court proceedings in relation to alleged illegal land clearing. And I knew that Glenn was the investigating officer in relation to that. Glenn said to me, this is the law. And yet the other people were completely disregarding the law. Elena Anderson lives next door to the Turnbull property. She knew Glenn well and believed in the work he was doing to protect native trees. He was doing exactly what we wanted him to do. He was helping us. In 2011, the Turnbulls began clearing native trees on two properties to make room for more crops. In just three years, the land's value increased by $5 million. How much is his land worth? Oh, look, I don't know. I'm, I guess the family's holdings are... Uh, are, are, are in the tens of millions, but I, I don't know how much he owes. Land worth killing for? According to him, it was. Glenn Turner investigated the removal of 3,000 trees from the Turnbull family properties. The evidence he gathered led to the Turnbulls being convicted of illegal clearing and ordered to pay $140,000 plus costs. Ian Turnbull fixated on Glenn as the source of his troubles. What did Glenn mean to him? What did he represent? All, all Glenn represented to him was that, that, that he was the one that was taking away the family fortune or the ability to create further money um, by developing the land. But, but Glenn was only a foot soldier of, of, of the government of the day. Glenn was doing the job that he was paid to do. Still, Ian Turnbull was obsessed with Glenn and wanted revenge. Exerts his power over and above what the Native Bank, Bank Vegetation Act is. Yeah, and if you don't know him, then he always says, oh, by the way, I'm Glenn Turner, as though he's somebody bloody special. On July 29, 2014, Glenn and Robert were in the Golden Triangle investigating land clearing. They noticed that native trees had been knocked down and were burning on one of the Turnbull properties. Ian Turnbull hadn't seen or spoken to Glenn Turner for two years. But when he got word that Glenn was out here on this lonely stretch of road, he picked up his pump-action rifle, got into his ute, and set out for a showdown with an unarmed man. Environmental officers Glenn Turner and Robert Strange were on patrol, looking at farms near Moree. Glenn had left home earlier that day saying goodbye to his wife and two children. My biggest worry was that he might have a car accident. That, that was because there was so much driving involved and, and that was my biggest fear. Late in the day, the two officers noticed freshly bulldozed trees on a farm operated by the powerful Turnbull family. 79-year-old Ian Turnbull had got word that they were there and was on his way to confront them. He was armed with a rifle. So you heard the car coming up and you thought nothing of it? Well, I thought it was somebody that was going to ask us what we were doing there, which is the norm. We, we were on the road reserve. We weren't on uh, anyone's private property. Ian Turnbull had pulled up and without a word, walked towards Glenn and Robert with his gun raised. We finished doing what we were doing uh, and then uh, when we turned around to walk back to the vehicle, uh, I saw a man with a uh, rifle. 
Ian Turnbull was just 15 metres away from Glenn. He aimed at his head and pulled the trigger. The first shot hit him in the face, hit him in the chin area. Second shot hit him in, in upper left chest. The first shot was aimed for his head and the second shot was aimed for his heart. So he wanted to kill him with the first shot? I believe so. He pointed the weapon at me and he told me to move drop back and to drop the camera that was in my hand. I just pleaded with him that, that we were unarmed, we were here to do a job, that's all we're there to do. Um, he, he, he'd respond that, that we weren't letting the Turnbulls do their job, you know, that Glenn uh, had persecuted them. Let me get him some help. I said, I need to get him some help and I need to get him out. He said that the only way he's going is in a body bag. Glenn was losing a lot of blood and was becoming weaker by the second. I had him crouched down. I kept calling him forward on the car when Turnbull would move to the back of the vehicle or vice versa. If Turnbull had moved up to the front, I'd say, Glenn, move to the back, move to the back. And I kept trying to get a bit closer so that when he got to the front, if he was trained on Glenn, I, I might be able to, to, to at least rush him. I just pleaded with him to let us get some help, that Glenn had a young family, that, you know, he needed to get home to them. And he said, I told you to fucking get back, I will kill you. And this game of, of, of chase around the car continued. The deadly cat and mouse game was becoming increasingly desperate for Glenn, who was bleeding badly from gunshot wounds to his chin and upper chest. How bad were his injuries at this stage? His voice was, was somewhat croaky. Um, but, but he, he, he was, you know, he was still doing everything I, I told him to do. He, 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 every time I'd tell him to move forward, crouch down, move back, he did it. He would, like, I've never been in a war zone, but what that man did under fire is beyond belief. Absolutely beyond belief. Because the bravery he showed should never be forgotten. And, and it's something that I'll always remember. And it's, it's the issue that I have that I couldn't get him home. And I live with that daily because he was so brave. Robert's only thoughts were on trying to save his mate and survive the ordeal. It was getting darker and darker and, and I think he, Turnbull was becoming more and more frustrated but he hadn't, hadn't done what he wanted to do. And What was that? Oh, kill Glenn. He was walking around the car and, and you he, knew at that point he wanted to finish the job. Oh, if, 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 he'd, if he'd had any, any sense of compassion, he would have let us go. He, he'd put the fear of God into us. He'd, he'd shot an innocent man twice. He went there with the sole intention, in my opinion, to kill Glenn Turner. And he wasn't leaving until he did. During the course of the attack, Glenn somehow managed to switch on an EPIRB, sending an alarm with their location to authorities in Canberra. But Turnbull kept firing. He put another two shots through the, the, the canopy of the vehicle. And then Turnbull came around the back of the car and, and, and fired at Glenn. And I, I honestly heard the bullet pass my right ear. It was that close to both of us. Gotta get out of here. And Glenn pleaded with me. He said, you've got to get me out. We've got to get out. The darker it was getting, the more frenzied our Turnbull was becoming. What do you mean frenzied? Well, two shots had been fired and then, then a standoff occurred for about 20 minutes around the vehicle. And in the next five minutes, three or four shots were fired. He was becoming uh, more and more aware that, 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 that light was slipping away and that, that he needed to do what he wanted to do. In a desperate bid to save himself, Glenn made a break for it in the dark. He got probably five metres from the vehicle and I, I seen Turnbull raise the firearm. And I, I think I just said, I don't know. And shot him and killed him. lowered his firearm, looked at me and said, I'm going home to wait for the police, you can go now. He walked back to his car. Conducted a U-turn and drove off. 
Back in Tamworth, Glenn's wife Alison returned home to find a message that Glenn's emergency beacon had been activated. So I rang and said who I was and um, I even jokingly said, have you located him yet? I, I, I just thought it was just a mistake. And they said, um, there's, yes, there's been a shooting, um, Glenn's been shot and I can give you the number of a police officer who can give you more information. Robert Strange had watched Ian Turnbull shoot Glenn in the back and then drive off. What did you do? It was dark. I, I, I ran straight to the car. Put, put the lights on where Glenn was. Went and sat down with Glenn and poured some water over him. Mate, you got to hold on. Glenn, come on. Come on, Glenn. you got to hold on, buddy. I just said, come on. We've got to get home. But I knew he was dying. He had very, very shallow breath, very shallow. And but I knew he was in a bad way. And I said, "Come on, mate. You know you got to get home for your family. You got to do what you got to do." And um, I heard a car come back down from the way the Turnbull had left, and I knew that my phone wasn't working. I just knew I had to get us some help. As the lights approached, Robert became convinced that Turnbull had returned to finish him off. If he's going to run me over, I don't want to see it. So I just stood there with my eyes closed. And luckily it was a young fellow that stopped and we rang uh, Triple O. For what seemed like an eternity, on, Robert cradled it. Glenn in his arms. You can do it. Stay with me. A neighbour who had come to help told Robert that Glenn hadn't made it. She came over to me and said, he's passed away. I'd... I'd I'd known, but I was, I was hoping he wasn't. On the phone to police, Glenn's wife, Alison, was told that her husband had been shot. As horrible as that was, I still didn't think for a minute that he would be dead. I just thought, OK, it's possibly an accident that's happened out on a farm somewhere, because they happen a lot. And eventually, I was put through to a detective and he broke the news to me over the phone that Glenn was dead. It appeared to be an open and shut case of murder, but it wasn't. Incredibly, Ian Turnbull would plead not guilty. It was definitely premeditated and it was... It was... It wasn't an accident, it wasn't as a result of anybody, anybody's mental illness. It was, it was a planned and cowardly attack on somebody who was defenseless. Two years after Glenn Turner was murdered, his wife Alison and children Alexandra and Jack are doing their best to carry on. We have a very big hole in our lives now, but we still need to maintain some sort of, I have to maintain some normality for the children. But there will be no normality until there's justice. In April, the murder trial of Ian Turnbull, now 81, began in the New South Wales Supreme Court. Turnbull's defence argued that because of a mental condition, he should be convicted of manslaughter, not murder. Alison was shocked. I just want it to be justice for Glenn and I just want a guilty verdict because that's what it is and there is no, absolutely no excuses. No excuse. Alison attended court with Glenn's sister, Fran Pierce. Turnbull's lawyer, claimed the environmental officer's eagerness to investigate land clearing had made the farmer lose control and snap. Glenn's sister was outraged. I'm not sure how this gets twisted around to be all about a poor old farmer. You know, it's not about him. He's the one that caused this. It's actually about my brother who's lost his life doing a job, um, an important job, and a job he believed in. 
cappuccino. Okay. The most confronting moment of the trial was when Alison saw her husband's killer for the first time. He has no emotion on his face whatsoever. That was a difficult moment, I've got to say. Very difficult. Found it hard to look at him. Even behind bars, Ian Turnbull was still very much in charge of the family business. Uh, so the main thing is to get the bloody uh, EP and H off, off our bloody back so the boys can go ahead and farm. Despite all that had happened, Turnbull was still angry at the Department of Environment and Heritage over land clearing fines. These are prison phone recordings of Turnbull speaking with his son. How are we going with the bloody thing as far as, you know, fighting these bastards and paying the bloody uh, fines and whatnot here? Is, they work, is Butler working on those or not? Yeah, no, Sylvester's working on those. Um, he said, well, you know, at this stage, you just don't, don't pay anything. He said, they, you know, if you don't pay it, they'll send you to jail. So, you know. Well, I'm in jail. Uh, exactly. So, yeah. Sylvester said, we're in no hurry to do anything. Then Turnbull revealed his callous disregard and complete lack of remorse for his victim, Glenn Turner. Six exerts his power over and above what the Native Act, Back Vegetation Act is. Yeah. yeah. And if you don't know him, then he always says, oh, by the way, I'm Glenn Turner, as though he's somebody bloody special, or he was anyway. The most damning evidence against Turnbull came from the only witness to his crime, Robert Strange. When I got into the, into the, um, into the witness box, I deliberately stared straight at him and, and he, he wouldn't hold eye contact with me. You know, he just would not hold eye contact. I tried a couple of times throughout giving evidence and he just wouldn't, he wouldn't look at, in my direction. Why did you want to hold his, his gaze? I wanted him to know that, that, <clears throat> Glenn and I went and do a job that day and I had to finish it and that's when I said to Glenn I'll get us justice and I knew all along that uh, that I had to give my evidence and and he had to be accountable for what he did the trial lasted six weeks Ian Turnbull was found guilty of murder and sentenced to 35 years jail with a non-parole period of 24 years. We're never going to be able to fill the void that's been left in our lives. But we got a, the right result. For Fran and Alison, the fight for justice is now over. But the pain of their loss remains deep and raw. It's not fair. <laughs> I know you are. Where, where do you go now? What, what, what's, what's next for you? You can't just sit and wallow for the rest of your life. So, and that's not what Glenn would have wanted. So, you know, What would he have wanted? Oh, he, he would just want us to be happy and to, to stay here and um, to see the kids, you know, grow into decent people. And, um, that was all he ever wanted was that for them to have a good, good education, travel the world just as he did, um, just grow into decent human beings. Robert Strange has not worked a day since the attack and is suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. He did all he could to save Glenn and make sure his killer was brought to justice. No one needs to go to work and cop that. No one has to go to work, nobody, and not come home because of the, uh, of, of, of the actions of another person. The man who did this is going to die in prison. Yeah, yep. And, um, that's a cross he has to bear. You know, I, 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 need, I need to, I need to put him away from, he's done what he's done and, and, and he, you know, he, he has to deal with that. His family have to deal with, with the fact that, that he's a convicted murderer um, and, and, and that's how he will die.